I'm glad I finally got here. And we're glad that you're here this morning. I asked Riley, I said, how do you want to do this? Sermon or lesson? And he said, well, most of the time they do a sermon, but you can do it how you want to. So we're going to do one sermon and one lesson. How about that? And uh, hopefully it'll be a good day for you. I know it's already been a good day for me. And uh, it's a joy to always come and get to see uh, good faithful brethren. And uh, uh, I look forward to the fellowship that we've had. This is the first time I've ever been here. And uh, it's uh, just a, a delight to be, uh, be here and also to be asked. It's an honor. So thank you very, very much. Um, the word grandparent or grandparents and the word grandfather are never found in the pages of our Bibles. But the word grandmother is found one time. And it's when Paul wrote to Timothy, when I call to remembrance thy un the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelled first in thy grandmother Lois, and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in thee also. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. But even though that might be the case, that the words are not found there, my friends, ever since that first couple's children had children, grandparents have existed. And we can group grandparents in all kinds of categories, can't we? We can group them with regard to their proximity or their location. There are some grandparents that we might refer to as never seen grandparents. They're just so far away that the grandchildren never get to see them. There are other grandparents that we might refer to as Seldom seen grandparents, but at least they're seen. I know that's the way it was with my uh, grandparents on my mother's side. We usually saw them maybe two or three times a year. They only lived about two and a half hours away, but back then it was a little bit harder to travel when I was little, and so we didn't get to see them quite as often, and they didn't drive down to see us very much. So kind of seldom seen, and then there are those ones that are very closely located. Those are grandparents that get to be seen almost every day of those children's lives. Sometimes there are grandparents who are live-ins, aren't they? The parent gets so old that the children bring them into their home and now the children get to be around grandma or granddad every day of their lives while they're growing up. It could be that those grandparents are live-with grandparents. The children have come back home and they brought their kids with them. And you're thinking, boy, when are they leaving again? So there's a lot of different categories with regard to uh, location. We can talk about grandparents also from the standpoint of maybe their personality type. Uh, maybe you want to refer to it as their attitude or how they behave. Uh, there's one group of grandparents that are referred to as Pollyanna grandparents. Those are the grandparents who are always there, ready to support in any shape, form, or fashion. If a child needs shoes, it's shoes. If a child needs a little bit of money for schooling, they get that little bit of money. If a child needs to be taken somewhere, guess who? Grandma and granddad can always be counted on. Pollyanna grandparents. And then there's a category that are oftentimes referred to as grumpy grandparents. There's a few old folks out there that are just grumpy, aren't they? And they cry and they complain about almost everything. If you ever talk to them, you think they got the worst grandchildren in all the world. But they just cry and complain about how bad they are. And then there are the grandparents that are what I refer to as the laboratory grandparents. These are the grandparents who expect the children to learn and learn and learn. And learn. And they're just always trying to teach those children a little something. And then you might have a category that are known as the cool grandparents. iPhone. iPad. They know what it is when you talk to them about all that techy stuff. You walk into their house and boy, their TV set up with all the latest systems. And they just got everything there. Cool grandparents. So grandparents fall into a lot of different categories. 
The title of my lesson this morning is this. The power of the previous generation. My friends, it doesn't matter what kind of grandparent you are. If you have the slightest relationship with those grandchildren, and I have two, then you will some power within their lives. And sometimes this power about which we speak, we don't think about it very often. And a lot of times in order to administer the power, you don't even have to hardly think about it. You don't have to really plan for it because you just kind of are already in automatic mode wielding the influences about which we're going to speak for the next few moments. When am I supposed to wrap this up? 30 minutes. Oh man, we can get this done in about 40. So uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, let's talk about six or seven powers that we can wield over the next generation or generations. The first power that I refer to is the power of relation. A relationship can be defined as a bond of emotion that brings two individuals into a very intimate interaction with one another. And folks, when we talk about relationships, there are certain keys, there are certain glues that bring this relationship together and hold it together very tightly. Take, for instance, there is the feeling of love found in a relationship. There's also in a relationship what we might refer to as genuine trust. And thirdly, for there to be a good relationship, there needs to be open communication. You and I usually have a relationship, don't we, with our grandchildren. There is that love, there is that respect, there is that trust, there is that communication that exists between us. And folks, in our relationship with our grandchildren, there is a power that you and I wield that is like any other power on the face of the earth. Because you see, I am not the parent anymore. That's kind of nice, isn't it? No. I don't have to be responsible in that way. I'm now the grandparent. And in that relationship, there are a lot of things that I can offer to my children and my grandchildren because of who I am. Number one, I can. They may not like it, but I can offer advice. Secondly, sometimes I can be the go-between, can I? I can be that mediator that exists between mom and dad and between the child that is my grandchild. And folks, sometimes all I need to be there for in that relationship is encouragement, isn't it? I can encourage my children. I can encourage my grandchildren. It may be encourage my children to continue to parent the way they're parenting. It's a hard job. It's a difficult job. But just keep going. Keep doing what you need to do. It may be that I have to encourage the grandchildren. They don't really agree with what mom and dad are doing. The decisions that they're making. And I just keep encouraging them, don't you? You do what mom and dad want you to do. You keep being who you really need to be. And folks, in that relationship itself, there is wonderful power. And we don't need to forget that. And there's a second power that we wield within this relationship as well. And I refer to it as the power of of faithfulness. How would I define faithfulness? The Bible exhorts us to that, doesn't it? Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Revelation 2, verse 10. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2. Faithfulness is a requirement. And in that faithfulness, there is a power. But what is it to be faithful? First, to be faithful, I must be child of the living God, must I? But 
folks, faithfulness is more than just being able to acknowledge that, yes, I obey the gospel. Faithfulness involves a walk of life, it says. It involves that daily, constant living of my Christianity in my life. That's faithfulness. And if you and I are living faithfully, and I assume that you are, if you've taken off a Saturday to come here, me, in this lesson, you're a faithful individual. Folks, in that faithfulness, there is wonderful power at our disposal. Let me talk about three powers that are found in faithfulness. Number one, you have the power of prayer. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, I will therefore, first of all, that prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks, listen to me, be made for all men. I don't know about you, but all men include my children and my grandchildren. Paul says, I want you to get on your knees. I want you to go into your closet. And I want you to pray for all men. And that includes my own family. Folks, think of that power. When you and I go before the throne of the Almighty God, we are laying our petition. And a being who we refer to as Almighty. God told Abraham in Genesis 17 verse 1, I am the Almighty God. Nothing is impossible for him. Nothing is too, too uh, strong that he cannot overcome. Secondly, he is a God who has all resources at his disposal, does he not? Folks, He is the creator of the world. He is the creator of the universe. Everything belongs to Him. There is nothing that He cannot tap into. My children are struggling. My grandchildren are struggling. And I go before the throne of God. And I bring their names to the mind of God. And folks, I just ask the most powerful, the, more, the most resourceful being in all the universe to come to their aid. That is power on behalf of our grandchildren and children. But say, because we are faithful, then we are knowledgeable individuals. Folks, you've been studying the Word of God for years and years and years. You've been coming to the worship services. You've been coming to Bible classes. And you've been learning the Word of God over and over and over again. Your mind is full of the wisdom of God. And now I can take that wisdom and at the right time, at the right moment, guess what I can do? I can now teach my children. Isn't that what happened to Timothy? Timothy's faith didn't dwell in him first, the Bible says. It dwelled first in his grandmother, Lois. Then in his mother, Eunice. Then in him. Folks, we have a faith that is being passed down from generation to generation to generation. And faith doesn't just magically happen, does it? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Those women were constantly teaching. That little bitty boy, as he was growing up, and he grew up to be a man of great faith. That's a power, folks, that we have at our disposal. I find occasionally that I'm just in the right spot at the right time. I had my little grandson the other day, and they came to visit us. And we were just out driving around, and guess what? I could just start talking to him. He was a captive audience. Couldn't get away from me unless he wanted to jump out of the car. Folks, that's power, isn't it? But there's a third power that we have, and it's the power of example. Paul told Timothy, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of believers. And he gives him six areas in which to be an example. In word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Six areas. I know this. I know when those little children are around, they may act like they don't give a hoot about you. They may be watching TV. They may be wanting to go outside. But folks, it's amazing, isn't it? How their little eyes are watching. Grandma and grandma. And they're watching to see how you live. They're watching to see how you conduct yourselves. And you can be a wonderful example to those individuals. 
And all of a sudden, they're back at home with mom and dad, and they say, well, why then does grandma and grandpa do this? Oh, they've been watching somebody. Folks, we need to understand that we have power with those grandchildren in our faithfulness. Prayer, teaching, and example. Point number three. I refer to this as the power of refinement. Again, we've been living the Christian life for a long time. We've gone through the struggles. We've gone through the battles, haven't we? And folks, sometimes when I look at grandparents, and especially look into the lives that they've lived and what's really been affecting them, there's some grandparents who have been through some pretty tough times. It may have been economically and financially. It may have involved their career and their work life. It may have involved relationships. It may have even involved their spiritual walk in the body of Christ. Maybe they've been through church splits and church troubles. Folks, all of those things about which we are speaking, guess what they do? They refine us, or at least they're supposed to. Paul says this in Romans 5, verses 3 and 4. Therefore, we rejoice in tribulation, knowing that tribulation or patience and patience experience. And experience hope. Folks, had it not been for the trials, had it not been for the tribulations, then I wouldn't have the patience. I wouldn't have the experience. And I wouldn't have the hope that I presently have had it not been for my going through all of those things. Again, it was James who writes this. Rather count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and in time, wanting nothing. James 1, 2 through 4. You see again, he says, rejoice in those struggles. Rejoice in those tribulations. Why? Because when you come out on the other end, you can be a perfect individual, not sinless. Folks, you can be an individual who is full and complete and mature. What I refer to as a refined person. You turn over to Peter's epistle, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, and he talks about that refining process, does he not? Here were Christians who were in great heaviness of sorrow, he says. They were going through manifold temptations. But, Paul, but Peter says, these are nothing more than the fire of trial. And when you come out on the other end, you'll be more precious than gold. Yea, much fine gold. Don't you have been through the hardships? You've been through the struggles. You've been through the difficulties. And you shine because of that. And now... We can take all of those experiences, can't we? And we can now give assistance to our children and grandchildren. Here they are struggling with some sin in their life. And now you and I can step in and try to help them get through that sin as well. You and I can teach them about the importance of self-discipline. And how they're going to have to be able to control their tongue, control their anger, control their appetites for the flesh in order to be what they need to be in this world. Maybe they're struggling with a relationship. And yes, to us, it's almost silly, isn't it? Especially those teenage relationships. And folks, if we'll think back, we've been there. We've been in those kind of relationships. We've been through some of those struggles. And there we are to help and assist them as they go through their difficulties. Folks, that's the power of refinement. You and I have experiences in areas that those kids have never been through. And when they finally reach that point that they're going through what we're there to help support them, help teach them, help hold them up, and make them through 
that particular struggle. Folks, that's a power, is it not? Fourth power. I refer to it as the power of time. Most grandparents reach an age finally where they can retire. I told Kathleen the other day, I don't even think about that word. As long as I've got health and as long as I can, I'll be working, I suppose. I don't even think about it. She started kind of thinking about it. We're not that old, you know. But she's already thinking. She hadn't even been working for about six or seven years as a nurse. And I think, you already been thinking about retirement? Man, I've been doing this 30 years. I'm going to retire. You keep going. When you get to be 30 years working, we'll both quit. And <laughs> I then mean, I'll be dead. Uh, but grandparents, a lot of them are just working part-time jobs, aren't they? And they have a little time on their hands. And I know when you invite the kids over, boy, isn't that a struggle? Man. Especially the little bitty ones. Two, three, four, six, eight, twelve, eighteen. All those little bitty ones. They're all a struggle, aren't they? It doesn't matter what age it is. It's difficult. But folks, you would not believe what that time does for us. You know what? Does it take time to build good relationships. Oh, yeah. And you want to know what? Sometimes children get jealous of grandparents because grandparents can give more time than they can to the children. And guess what happens? Those children get a little bit closer to grandma and grandpa than they even do to mom and dad. You see, it takes time to build a relationship. And now you have that. In that time... We can now spend what is oftentimes said by some as quality time. There's a myth out there. And the myth says this. Spend quality time with your children. Or really it goes more like this. Make quality time with your children. I don't know about you, but every time I tried to make quality time, it was the biggest fiasco that you could possibly imagine. Okay, we're going to set aside 30 minutes or an hour. And it's going to be quality time. Oh. And there was fighting and ratting and raving and everything. And you go, well, this is the worst quality time that I've ever spent in my life. Those quality of time comes in quantity of time. There you are, and you're just spending some time together, and all of a sudden, you look back and you say, you want to know what? That was quality time. I hadn't planned it. I hadn't tried to force it and make it happen. But that Quality time. And our grandchildren need some of that. It's in that quality time and that quantity of time that you and I develop precious memories with those children, you know. And folks, that's what they need sometimes. Sometimes after we're dead and gone, they need to just be able to look back and they need to remember something that we were doing together. Folks, it's that one memory that can make a wonderful difference in their life. Time. Folks, time doesn't need to be wasted. Time doesn't need to be squandered. Time doesn't need to be put off. Because you see, the very moment that time is spent, we can never, ever, ever get it back. Paul exhorts us, does he? Redeem the time for the days are evil. Folks, we've got to buy up the precious time that we have and use it to the very best of our ability. The power of time. This next power that I speak of is somewhat unique and it is also one that is dying to some extent. I refer to it as the power of skill. <coughs> Anybody in here can? Anybody in here quilt? Anybody in here do woodwork? I'm telling you, some of this skill is dying. <laughs> Not many people raising their hand. Okay? Folks, there's some older individuals who have the ability to do some things. Okay? That uh, children just are no longer taught how to do. You know what I mean? And you'd be amazed. What I ask you, how many of you cook? Any of you cook? That's a dying art too. 
My kids left the house, and guess what? My wife said, it's over. No more cooking. I thought, are you kidding me? I'm still here. Just a dying art, okay? Oh, she cooks a little, okay? It's got the Walmart or something written on the side of the bag. But, folks, our kids need individuals to take them aside, don't they? teach them and train them in some skills. When you go back and you study Judaism, okay, every child, even if he went to the finest of schools, such as the Apostle Paul, guess what? They had a trade that they were taught. We all know that the Apostle Paul was a tent maker, don't we? Acts 18, verse 3. And even our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, He was known as the carpenter, wasn't He? Mark 6, verse 3. They understood the need for a child to learn something with their hands. What a wonderful thing it is for a grandparent to get that child aside and begin to teach that child a little something that one of these days they can use long after we're gone. Folks, you know what you got to do in order to teach one of those children a skill? First, you've got to start early. You're not going to grab a 16-year-old who's hooked up in an iPad and say, Hey, why don't you come over here and learn to can? Are you kidding me? A little bit late, didn't you? After you started out at two, three years old. That's a different story, isn't it? I remember on one occasion, my grandmother, she was trying to teach us how to, she called it canning corn, but we were really putting it in bags. Okay? We went out there, and boy, we got all those ears of corn, and we shut those things, and we got all the silk off of them, we cut all that corn off, she put it over there, cooked it, got it hot, and she was in a hurry. And she says, go get those bags, so we did. And she started dipping that corn in those bags. We had about 30 bags. 20 of them busted wide open probably. We just laughed. Grandma was going crazy. But she's trying to teach us a little something. Okay? Corn doesn't come from Walmart. Come, come, corn comes off a column. It takes a little work sometimes. But boy, that's the best kind, isn't it? So start early when they're, when they're young. And folks, the second thing, it's going to take a little bit of time, isn't it? And children are impatient. So guess what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to try your best to make it fun. And not just a laborious, unfun experience. I remember my grandma, she used to say, come on, baby. let's go down to the hen house and gather eggs. Now, folks, that's been a long time since I reached under an old hen and got an egg or two. Do you know what? That, that's fun stuff. I still remember. My sister hated it. She couldn't hardly stand it. But that was fun times to be out there with my grandma. And, I, and she's been gone a long time now. And I still remember those things. My granddaddy went out the field one day and he had a um, old sheet uh, for the pigs and he brought that up and he said, Vic, I'm going to work. He said, you see that old sheet? I just want you to tear that thing down today. Man, I spent all day hammering, busting that thing down. He comes in and he's mad that he got that done. It looks good. Thank you. Those are things you remember from your grandparents. Giving you things to do. Teaching you how to do things. To be diligent about it. Folks, we need children today who are taught a good work ethic, don't we? It's unbelievable the world that we live in. Teach your children a skill. You have that power. Here's another uh, power that you have. And we may not like to talk about it, but yet it, it is a power. And I would say it is the power of money. The power of money. When you're raising your children, you're not able to save a lot of money, are you? Especially, well, it's been that way almost, I guess, since day one. Families and children, they have a lot of needs, and it takes a lot of money to pay for those needs. Finally, those children are gone, and guess what? You can start saving just a little bit, can't you? You finally save your little nest egg, and I don't know about you, but it doesn't bother me one iota to pull a little bit of money out and help if I know that I can help. Not one bit does that bother me. And you want to know where a lot of our money goes? It almost is nauseating to me today. A lot of our money goes into just gimmicks and gifts and gadgets, doesn't it? You call and ask kids, what do you want for your birthday? It's not a matchbox car anymore. Granddad, I want a Kindle Fire. Okay, 
son, I'll get that for you. You run down to Walmart, two hundred and sixty-nine dollars, and you got to go crazy. I've already agreed to buy it now. It's crazy, isn't it? You go to the party, man. It's like Christmas time. You go 